Welcome to everybody, and thank you all for enjoy, um, joining us uh, this um, afternoon. My name is uh, Victoria Pryor. I'm the Student Services Program Manager for the UWM Black Student Cultural Center. Hi, I'm Dr. Gladys Mitchell Walthour from the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies. Welcome, especially all of my students. I'm very excited about the speaker we have today. Um, I also wanted to mention that we have another speaker, December 3rd, um, Douglas Belchior, who is a Black Brazilian activist, and um, I will, the flyer for that event will go out. I'll turn it back over to, to you. Thank you. Well, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our presenter for um, this afternoon, and her name is Dr. Monique Liston. And she is an experienced evaluator and program designer. She founded Ubuntu Research and Evaluation as a professional learning community that, I'm sorry, prioritizes Black women and their leadership in building beloved communities. She is a proud alumni of Howard University with a BA in sociology and University of Delaware with a master's in public administration. In addition, she did receive her PhD in urban education from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. For the last 10 years, she has worked with educational institutions, including school districts, administrators, and policymakers across the United States and internationally. Her research focuses on understanding human dignity as a measure of accountability for organizations working to address issues of racial equity. She loves Black people, Blackness, and planning for liberation with love and accountability. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Monique Liston. Oh, thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you so much, Gladys. So excited to be here and in conversation with you all. Um, this is just going to be, I'm just excited <laughs> for this conversation and where we're going to be able to take it. I'm glad that people can use the chat. So I'm asking folks to check in, <laughs> right? Let us know that you're here, who you're representing, who, huge shout out to Freedom Colombo in the building. I uh, see public allies in the building, love on black women in the building. I see students in the building. Hey, Jason. Hey, Matthew, more PA folks. So excited. UWM Council in the building. Hey, y'all. Just excited to be here and to share space with you all. I hope this conversation is meaningful, um, that you get something from it. What's up, T? <laughs> um, but I, I hope to engage, right? That we can talk a little bit around this topic of black activism in Milwaukee. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to make space for us to, even though we're not sharing physical space together, to still uphold what I would normally create if we were in the physical space together by making room for us to do libation together. It doesn't make sense for me to engage in a conversation about what the ancestors have charged me and many of you all to do without calling them into this space, um, letting them know that we value and care for them. So I am going to, um, ask you all to, in this moment, to start thinking about, especially because we're talking about Black activism in Milwaukee, Black folks, <laughs> Black folks who have shown up as um, activists, as warriors, as soldiers who have led you and empowered you and set the stage for you. I want you to start thinking about their names because we want to I'm going to play this song in the background real lightly. <laughs> We need to be thinking about them, making sure that we say their names, make sure that we know that the work that we're doing is because of them. So I'm asking you, if you're beginning to think of those names, beginning to think about the Black folks on whose shoulders you stand, whose footsteps you walk in, who you call out to when you are praising, who you call out to when you are frustrated, I want you to say their names 
Say them out loud in the spaces that you're in. If you can, if you can't, I want you to share them in the chat because we want to see some of these names, share some of these names of our ancestors who are really setting the mold for us. It could be family members. It could be uh, people you just read about, but whoever they are, I ask that you share them in the chat or, or say them out loud in whatever spaces that you're in. Sojourner Truth, Caron Martin, Dr. Sheltrice McCoy, David Mitchell Jr., Edna Bardhill, John Martin, Marielle Franco, Malcolm X. Thinking of Harriet Tubman. I'm thinking of Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm thinking of Audrey Lord. I'm thinking of um, Octavia Butler, John Lewis. But yes, so many folks whose names we are naming, letting them know that we are calling them into this space in love and care and appreciation and healthy vibrations. For those of them who are still living, we are sending light and healthy vibrations towards them that they protect themselves. For those who have passed, we are lifting them up making sure they know that their names are not forgotten, that their legacy still lives on, and they are still really resonant in our everyday lived experiences. Shouting out so many people. I see Malcolm X. I see Marcus Garvey. I see Dr. King, Molly Canary, Joseph Bean, Lorraine Hansberry, Essex Temple. Such beautiful names being shared. Continue to share some of those names as we just take in all of that energy, what we're calling into this space as we begin to think about Black activism in Milwaukee. <laughs> what does it mean in our immediate and local context? Ella Baker, yes. Stephen Biko, yes. Betty Shabazz, Coretta Scott King, Queen Khalifa. The universe with aspects of the all encompassing our entire being, singing in harmony with joy in pleasure beyond measure in passion for life, voiced like the song of the river, flowing in the sensual grace of Oshun. Oshun, Pepperu, Nana AC, Oshun, representing the beautiful. Feminine features of life, lightly dancing to a timeless rhythm, in tune with the tone of a spiritual offering, a prayer with props to the highest. Thank you all so much for sharing. I appreciate all the names that were brought into the space. Um, just looking forward to what we're able to create and experience together in this conversation now that we have welcomed the important people uh, both on earth and across <laughs> the universe into this space with us. I'm going to get us ready for this presentation of short sorts. Excuse me. About Black <laughs> activism in Milwaukee. So I felt compelled, <laughs> right, to acknowledge Black AF, right, we can make the connections as we need to, <laughs> activism in Milwaukee, to really stress um, the unapologetic nature of really being able to live and activate through um, unapologetic Blackness, right? I just want to lift that up, its realities and that lived experience. We began with the libation, setting the tone, being able to welcome folks into the space. Um, and I just want to be, you know, crystal clear on what is grounding our conversation. And that is this definition of anti-Blackness. Anti-Blackness, I believe, <laughs> is the distance between Black people and your acceptance of their dignity. Now, those of you who have heard me talk about dignity, I consider dignity to be a mutual sense of self-worth between an individual and the communities that they're in, right? And inherently, the world that we are currently in is anti-Black. <laughs> and so the distance between Black people who recognize themselves as fully human <laughs> and others <laughs> accepting them as fully human and in that fullest sense of dignity 
is anti-blackness. That's where it lives in that space. And I think it's important, you know, oh man, I was going to see how far I was going to make it without shouting out um, Howard University, but I made it to the third slide. <laughs> and as a proud daughter of Howard University, and of course I get to stand on that right now because Howard is going to be in the White House come 2021. Um, I'm reminded of another Howard alum, some of you all know as Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture, um, someone who I've studied their work <laughs> incessantly. I'm reminded of what he said in, I believe it was 1963. It was before the um, Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. It was being uh, discussed on the Senate and House floors. And Stokely Carmichael delivered what was known as his famous Black Power speech. And in that speech, he is speaking to folks at Berkeley. Um, I mean, you know, something around this time in the 60s, you had so many folks, um, so many white folks bringing black intellectuals and activists into the space to cuss them out. That, <laughs> that was the thing <laughs> at that time. But you had Stokely Carmichael, and this was when he was, you know, moving into that space of leaving SNCC and being a part of the Black, po uh, black Panther Party. He was reminding this group of mostly white college age students that the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 was not for him. The passing of that bill was not doing anything for him as a black man. That bill was passed or needed to be passed, debated and discussed because white folks needed a policy to let them know that they should treat him as a full human being. Like, let's sit with that for a minute. <laughs> as we are processing what it means for us to be activated and doing activist work in a local level, we have to understand the role of some of the things that we engage in, what they really mean. Stokely Carmichael, as a Black man, said, I don't need a piece of policy or legislation to let me know that I'm a Black man worthy of dignity and respect. This society, built upon the premise of whiteness being the norm, needs a policy so that it can begin to consider me as worthy of dignity and respect. Do you understand that there's a huge gap between <laughs> what Stokely Carmichael was saying for himself and the lived material, experiential <laughs> um, reality that was happening in the United States at that time. This distance, anti-Blackness, right? So I wanna make sure that we ground in that conversation that we understand that that's what we're talking about. There is a gap. <laughs> there is a gap between how I see myself and how the world as it's set up treats me, right? And so we're gonna explore this in terms of activism in four different areas. We're gonna go into the historical, just giving a little context. We're gonna go into the theoretical, you know, I'm an academic, <laughs> recovering, but one. The material, talking about what's actually happening right now in this moment, and then the practical, which is gonna be me asking y'all, where are you showing up in this? So usually it's an aha got you at the end, but I'm letting you know right now that you should be considering, based upon what we discussed today, what this means for you so we can get into that conversation in the practical sense right i open up our historical conversation thinking about baba john henrik clark right historian um advocate a pan-africanist who was really set on us understanding that Black folks in the U.S. had a connected experience to the African diaspora worldwide, particularly how white supremacy shows up and anti-Blackness becomes real. But what's most notable for this particular conversation that John Henry Clark said was that, one, history is a time clock, right? History is a time clock that allows you to understand your political time of day the events from five years ago, 5,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, have everything to do with what happens five minutes from now, five years from now, 50 years from now, 5,000 years from now. And so we look at <laughs> historical conversations, not to say that's back then, where are we now? That's sort of that linear, one directional, everything in the past was bad and we have to be continually progressing towards the future. John Henry Clark disrupts that, that says, no, all of this is contextual. <laughs> History lets us know where we are right in this moment, right? <laughs> what is our relationship to a broader understanding of 
like anti-blackness is letting us know the fullest expression of human dignity for black people. <laughs> what does that mean also in terms of the intersections therein when it comes to class and gender, sexuality, and all the other ways in which black people manifest in this world? We have to understand that. And in his closing statement, while he talks about that, he simply says, all history is a current event. And that's what we have to stand with in this moment. We're talking about Black activism in Milwaukee. There is no special moment now that's not connected to the housing marches, not connected to the first free Black folks who came up here, not connected to the indigenous folks that inhabit this land before colonization. All of this is connected. Right. And so we lift up John Henry Clark for opening the gate, for letting us know that history has everything to do with now and this moment has everything to do with the future. Right. And now <laughs> we connect to my other favorite. I got a little glow on my face because, you know, my feelings for Malcolm X. Oh, boy. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. And it was on April 8th, 1964, when he gave his speech called The Black Revolution. I'm sure many of you all have heard it or read it or come across it. But I bring this up because he highlights some important things that are relative to us understanding Milwaukee's context. Also, if you didn't know, John Henry Clark has a lot of um, respect and admiration for Malcolm, particularly as John Henry Clark was a Pan-Africanist and later on in Malcolm's life when he began to understand with the OAA, the Organization of African American Unity, like he was seeing and understanding Blackness on a global perspective. But he states, so America's strategy is the same strategy that which was used in the past by the colonial powers, divide and conquer. America plays one Negro leader against the other. She plays one Negro organization against the other. She makes us think we all have different objectives, different goals. And as soon as one Negro says something, she runs to this Negro and asks him, what do you think about what that other Negro said? Why anybody can see through that today, unfortunately, except some of those Negro leaders. What he argues then is all of our people have the same goals, the same objective, and that objective is freedom, justice, equality. All of us want recognition and respect as human beings. We don't want to be integrationists, nor do we want to be separationists. We want to be human beings. And integration is only a method that is used by some groups to obtain freedom, justice, and equality and respect as human beings. Separation is a method that is used by other groups to obtain freedom, justice, equality, and human dignity, right? So I bring that up in this particular moment because of the reality that comes in around, um, around um, Malcolm saying that, of like, we understand that if we don't understand our activist struggles among ourselves, the system, whiteness, white people will put our struggles against each other, even though they're bound up into the same concept, right? Even thinking about the disagreements that I have with other Black folks, it's more about the methods <laughs> and some of the frameworks and the understanding of what we're doing and less about what we all want, which is Black people want to be free, <laughs> right? Black people want to be free, especially in these activist circles. So just thinking about this disruption. And this quote hit me really hard recently. Um, and I'll just be transparent about the ways it hit me because, you know, I, in case you all haven't know, I, I talk a lot on social media and engage a lot on social media. And I said some things on social media and then um, um, another activist in Milwaukee said something different on social media. And then a white person came to my inbox and was like, well, that black person said that and you said that, what do you think? And to me, I was like, this is not a conversation I'm about to have with you. <laughs> this is not, because this is exactly what Malcolm pointed out 50 years ago is the problem, that you're gonna try to pit us together against each other as two people who have different ideologies that demonstrate that Black people have no unity nor have any agreement about how these things are supposed to work. I'm not going to allow you to do that. So I'm not even going to acknowledge that. <laughs> and I can go talk to the person just to see where are we on this conversation? Oh, I understand where you're coming from. This is nothing for me to engage, right? Because I'm not arguing <laughs> about some minutia right? <laughs> I'm going to mind my business and understand that this is an internal Black conversation. And we're not going to let whiteness dictate it. Again, remembering what anti-Blackness is and remember what Malcolm says of how whiteness works. Okay, I'm moving. I got a lot to talk about. I want to shout out from the historical uh, pers perspective, Sister Pam Eccles, who's still alive and well, um, who this picture, I just, just take this picture in, y'all. 
just take this picture in. It became really famous. I mean, I'm sure many of us have seen it. I'm sure you've talked about it. It's also in um, Patrick Jones' book, Some of the North. But this picture became really important because it got shared, I want to say in 2018 on social media, talking about you had a Black woman grabbing the face of a police officer without dropping her purse and all of her curls still in place. <laughs> I was like, yes, I cannot argue all of this. I cannot argue all of this. And just thinking about P Pam Eccles is alive and well at this moment. And I'm just so, this makes me teary eyed just to think about how this woman was able to show up and be and represent this type of energy and live to tell the story, right? This is the type of energy that I wanna have each and every day. And I know there's things that for my own well being keeps me from doing it, <laughs> right? And so I'm shouting out Pam Eccles centering in this conversation. There's a historical thing about understanding black activism in Milwaukee. And just so that you all, if you don't know, if you see this picture, Milwaukee deserves a shout out. We don't get enough shine for having <laughs> a large um, ongoing resistance to white supremacy here in Milwaukee. So shout this out whenever you see it. So moving from the historical, I wanna move into the, the theoretical. And in the theoretical, I'm talking about the conversation related to the wake. And if you're familiar with um, the book In the Wake on Blackness and Being, sorry, it's what it is at home. Um, I really highly recommend that book because I think it gives a nice cushioning, a nice framework juxtaposed with some other thoughts that I have for us to think about what Black activism is considering we're in this space called anti-Blackness, the distance between how I see myself and how the world sees me. And which again, I understand it as the wake. In that book, um, Chris, uh, the, the, on the, in the wake on Blackness and Being, the idea of a wake <laughs> um, as all of its different um, manifestations come out, right? The wake of a ship, the wake after a funeral, waking up and arising, consciousness, all of that is brought up. She states, wakes are processes. Through them, we think about the dead and our relationships to them. They are rituals through which to enact grief and memory. So just walking you to where we have been, right? We started with the libation where we brought in some of our ancestors into the room. Then we talked about anti-Blackness and then put a historical perspective on it, understanding that there's people who have gone this walk before and which whose memory we continue to do our work and engage. But also <laughs> what's also in our wake are the impacts of how Black people have died right? And knowing how many Black people have died, not of, you know, natural cause, causes in old age, but because of murder from the police state, because of fighting for their country to take care of their families, because of all of the um, hormonal stress, and just outright neglect because of what it means to be Black in this country, we are also moving through this anti-Blackness as a wake, right? Anti-Blackness, that distance between you seeing me, is full of those bodies, <laughs> those people who we mourn and grieve and our memory is still connected to that we continually have to realign ourselves and think about. And I bring that up because that's very real to understanding the Milwaukee context, to identify who's in our wake, right? There's names of folks who are in our wake. You know, we can name, we can name all of the folks recently. We can think about Breonna Taylor. We can think about George Floyd, but we also can think about, um, um, all the people who have been a part of the stories in our Wisconsin context and our Milwaukee context is also being, they, that's the ritual through which we enact grief and memory, right? It's understanding or engaging, doing that activism to know that we are continuing this fight because we remember them. We remember them. <laughs> we didn't forget them. We remember them. And so that's why we do the work that we do. She goes on, Christina Sharp goes on to say in this um, book, I want in the wake to declare that Black, that Oops, excuse me, that we are Black peoples in the wake with no state or nation to protect us, with no citizenship bound to be respected and to position us in the modalities of Black life lived in as under despite Black death to think and be and act from there, right? So this distance between how, how I see myself and how the world sees me is awake, is anti-Blackness, but there's nothing to protect us outside of us. What's the saying? We all we got? <laughs> That's it. That's what we're understanding when we're doing wake 
thinking, wake, work, connecting ourselves to this current moment, understanding where we are. And we're doing this slow walk to get into what does it mean to be in the Milwaukee context. She goes on to kind of give some more illustrations. So we have the wake of the ship, the waters muddy and torn up, you know, going behind a ship. And we understand the metaphor of the ship and connected to black people. We're thinking about the slave ship, right? In my text, the weather is the totality of our environments. The weather is the total climate and that climate is anti-black. So you just think about what it means to be navigating the water behind a ship. A ship is gone, you're in the wake, the water is tumbly, you're trying to navigate it. And also we understand that the environment around me is not peaceful, calm and clear. It's not sunny skies. The environment around me is anti-black. The environment around me is not wanting me to survive this. It's not built for me to survive this or think about this. This is the context in which shapes activism, this space. And what I'm calling the weather, anti-Blackness is pervasive as climate. The weather necessitates changeability and improvisation. It is the atmospheric condition of time and place. It produces new ecologies. Because we're living in this space of anti-Blackness, where I see myself as one way and the world sees me as another, I'm in a constant condition of trying to reconfigure myself, right? Because <laughs> I'm trying to reconfigure myself because this gap should not exist. This little anti-Blackness gap should not exist and not be defining my experience or how I show up. And so I'm reconfiguring myself to try to figure out not just resistance and resilience, but also to get to the other side, <laughs> to get to another place. And so we morph, <laughs> right? We do all kind of tricks and acrobatics and you could probably feel that in your own being the ways in which you have morphed, adapted and changed in order to survive if you identify as a Black person right and noting that ecology the branch of biology that deals with the relationships the relations of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings the political movement that seeks to protect the environment especially from pollution new ecologies must be developed so that our survival can continue and those new ecologies are being developed right here in milwaukee right we don't have to go out some other place they're right here in the space that we are in Right, <laughs> and what does it look like and feel like for us to understand that? What would it mean to stay safe and to defend the dead, our impenitential ancestors, those who are actually dead and those who, whom the state refuses to grant life, those whom the state persists in choking the light uh, out of? We're thinking about the new ecologies that are created that actually make room, sorry, <laughs> that actually make room for us to exist and then flip the world on its head. Right, and I'll get into more of what I'm talking about there. Um, the word that I arrived at for such imagining and for keeping and putting breath back into the black body is in hostile weather is aspiration and aspiration is violent and sad and life-saving. Anybody has undergone or understood what that means in a life-saving context to undergo aspiration, especially when they put a, you know, trying to get air back into your lungs. It's a violent process <laughs> through your throat. It's not comfortable. You don't wish it upon anyone, which is especially real as we understand the COVID-19 realities, but understanding that that's the work that has to be done that sort of painful violent fight for life is the work that's being done so i'm just giving you this sort of theoretical background that shapes the work that we're doing i'll come back to this but i want to add this other component <laughs> right um to the theoretical framework which is thinking about the future right and connecting the future to what we know is the past that's impacting us right all history is a current event so that means we also have to be thinking about what the future is and what we want in the future so we can start enacting the things we know and feel now so that the future exists as we desire, right? And so we connect to an Afrofuturist mindset in making room for our radical imaginations to hold the notions of freedom, equity, liberation, those things that Malcolm was had identified that we all want despite the different strategies of getting there. So I just want to highlight a couple things that Afrofuturism is asking for us, considering that we are in the wake, right? First of all, we have to consider new possibilities, right? <laughs> um, the idea that we are being challenged to not accept the world as it is, but to look at it and prick at it and go like this and make different things and imagine beyond and say, what if I lived on Pluto and think about what if I was underwater? I have to think about those things because there has to be a way, there has to be a way that I can configure my liberation. 
I have to think about my liberation as a, a reality, something that's possible, something that I can actually start imagining for. We understand that Afrofuturism is a critical mindset because if I am assuming that the future contains liberated Black people, I have to be critical of the, the present in which Black people are not free. So if I have the audacity to imagine Black people in the future without the oppression of anti-Blackness, I have to be critical of the current context in which anti-Blackness exists. There is no such thing as a neutral position. <laughs> there is no, no, no such thing. Either we're doing that or we're not. <laughs> we're doing it or we're not. And rarely do I talk about those very like strict boundaries, but either we're doing it or we're not. It's not the extent which, no, no one's saying that, it's not qualified. It's just saying we're doing it or not. We're having the audacity to imagine black people liberated in the future or we're not doing it. We know that Afrofuturism overall is human centered and human centered means that we're getting closer to a the fullest potential of people's expression of their own dignity. We understand Afrofuturism is more than an aesthetic, is an epistemological frame. It is a way of knowing, right? So if I argue that Afrofuturism is having the audacity that Black people could exist in the future, it is a way of knowing that I can be critical against, right? I assume that, assume, believe, know that Black people are a part of the future. Therefore, when I'm presented with facts or information, it's not presuming that Black people are less than not societal equals should be death should be should die should be condemned no i'm challenging all of that <laughs> my way of thinking is that black people are in the future and they'll be free in the future so when you present me with information that's contrary to that i'm going to say we have to find a workaround to make that not true <laughs> so we're thinking about it's a way of knowing right Afrofuturism connects complexity, science, and emergent theories to equity and inclusion without limiting the understanding to what has already been determined as true that's everything I just said. <laughs> but also, it's really important as we about to go as we're going into what's happening on the ground in Milwaukee that regardless of organizations claiming it for, for themselves or not, and I'm not to label a theoretical framework on any of these practices, any of the folks who have the audacity to think about the future of black people without anti-blackness existing are working in an Afrofuturist perspective. <laughs> they are. Afrofuturism. Um, furthers the challenge of engaging positionality and reflexivity I'm here in culturally responsive evaluation, but in general, when we're thinking about how we're showing up in the world by centering blackness as a catalyst for change, instead of as a response to whiteness and its positionality. Most importantly, we're, we're thinking about, well, blackness is not something that is just something that I deal with because of the current state of affairs. It actually should be the channel that I'm trying to affirm into getting to a future of liberation, right? That's what I'm thinking about. That's where I'm trying to go. And so it's not just, shout out to Sun Ra, but it's not just an idea of this feels good and looks good or black cool, you know, that is the thing people research or cool pose or black girl magic. And it's not just that. It's like these things are connected to political implications. And those political implications are not just in our heads. <laughs> They're actually connected to material reality. So we went historical, we went theoretical. Now we're hitting material. I wanna share about some of the organizations who are doing this amazing work. First, we're gonna shout out Block. If you're not familiar with Block, get familiar. We're talking about um, Black leaders organizing communities. Scrolling down here. We are uniters working to lift up Black citizens, leaders and businesses of the community. We are transparent in our work to ensure the community we advocate for can hold us accountable. And I wanna share, um, I reached out to Angela Lane, who's the executive director of Block, just to shout out what they have done recently and where they're thinking of, Angela, this is Angela's words. We made over 200,000 phone calls and sent over almost 600,000 texts. We didn't always lead when they engaged people with the election. We sought feedback and also asked folks if they needed to be connected to resources because of the pandemic. We're excited for the time next year after April elections where we can continue to engage folks around these issues and inform folks different ways to be civically engaged without voting. Continuing to do political and historical education so people see the agency they can have in a system that wasn't designed for us to participate in. So we're thinking about here in Milwaukee, we have a Black woman-led organization that is thinking critically about what does it mean to engage, right? And how can we utilize a tool 
right, a method, which is voting, to get to our larger objectives, right? And so you can even hear the futurist talk in Angela's response about like, I'm looking forward to this next thing where we can talk to more people about more things that connect to their material realities right now. Reaching out to, we understand that voting is a current strategy that's relative and makes sense for them now, but also that there's a pandemic and we need to be connecting folks to resources. That is an example of material, the material realities we're talking about anti-Blackness. Next, shouting out um, the McCurtis family, Melody and Mama Danielle um, at Metcalf Community Bridges. If you're not familiar, get familiar. I want to uphold, uh oh, trying to move my, um, uh oh. Well, we'll start here. <laughs> Their current campaign, the People First, Wisconsin Black and PLC demands. We're talking about defunding police, investing in community free and fair elections. As the number of COVID-19 cases continue to rise, we've watched state leadership and elected officials rely on increased criminalization, law enforcement, imprisonment to address the global pandemic. In response to this escalating crisis, Freedom Inc., which is based in Madison, partnering with Metcalf Com Community Bridges based here in Milwaukee, are demanding the following of Governor Evers. So you're talking about defunding the police and free them all, give community power to conduct independent and concurrent investigations of the police, stop sending the National Guards to, um, um, stop sending the National Guard to <laughs> deal with communities, provide incentives for municipalities to reallocate, invest in the community, forgive all COVID related medical fees and provide free testing, which we do finally have, um, increase supplement food share for most impacted families. And we're talking about uh, free and fair elections and what has happened. So this is the current um, um, organizing effort, but shouting out Metcalf Community Bridges as a place to in, be involved, get involved, and to understand. Shout out to all my people who are in here just looking and browsing the chat. Um, next, thinking about and shout out to Shavonda Sisson, who I believe is in here to love on Black women. Again, Milwaukee-based organization. It's a people-driven fund. We trust Black women to be honest about their needs. We don't ask for follow-up, and we don't want dollars that come with the burden of proof. 100% of the money raised goes directly to Black women's pockets. Here you have, um, and you see Black represented down there. Hey, Ubuntu, that's us. <laughs> and other organizations coming together and understanding that when it <laughs> comes to disrupting and this what can I do, putting the hand putting money in the hands of black women is a disruption that fundamentally changes things right <laughs> and especially unrestricted funds you know i have been a huge advocate throughout the pandemic if people are like how do i donate instead of donating to your large nonprofits to put your hand money directly into the hands of black women cuz it gets to others who need it no matter what <laughs> even if they need it, it still gets to others who need it. Um, and I will share the links to all these organizations so people can be aware. I also want to um, thank you, Shavonda, for being present and for showing up. Love on Black women. I want to shout out Marquesa and the African American Roundtable. Um, they have a really big event coming up because they're going independent from their funder. Sorry that you're seeing everything that's on my Facebook. But the African American Roundtable provides a nonpartisan space for coalition partners and community leaders to connect around issues in our community through civic engagement, political education, and campaign work. Right? So seeing the connections, one, again, connecting the futures to all of these things. Love on Black Women is thinking about the ways in which we can determine, connect our material conditions to the future is to put our money in the hands of Black women so that they can spend <laughs> towards their futures, <laughs> right? And you have the round table who is having the organizations to come together to disrupt exactly what Malcolm had already said was the issue, right? That we're having these external outside white folks, <laughs> white land organizations to say, boom, boom, boom. There's These are the differences between what you believe. And it's like, no, nah, we don't even have to do all that. We got our own table that's led by <laughs> our own people to talk about our own issues and to align about our own strategies and methods, knowing that there's a goal of liberation in which we all share. We're just trying to align our vision and to understand that even though I'm not trying to vote, I understand why you're organizing people to vote. I'm not getting in your way. That's not my method. My method is going to be over here and shouting, shouting out the round table for holding that. They definitely need your support as they go independent from their large funder. And also want to shout out Comforce MKE. Um, because of the work that they're doing. This is again, bringing folks together, especially um, gra grassroots folks, bring them together, 
group of community resident youth leaders, activists, faith-based orgs, electives, and others striving towards peace, unity, and progress in Milwaukee. We're also a violence prevention platform as well as a source of true community news. It's a great place that we know does immediate response when it comes to um, violence prevention and um, supporting young people and getting young people out of dangerous situations and into safe spaces. So making sure that we are aware of this. What I also want to connect to, let's see if my um, window will let me do this, is the fact that these organizations have come together um, and these Comforce has put this together, but they've developed a set of policy demands, right? <laughs> we These demands are not small potatoes. They're very deep. You have Comforce um, talking about everything. Most recent thing, we know that um, that Wild Tulsa police officer who has shot and killed way too many people to not be in jail, um, even though I'm an abolitionist, so he shouldn't be in jail, but not to be dealt with. <laughs> um, but just thinking about what these demands are and how these demands are coming directly from these community-based organizations because they have the audacity to see themselves as being beyond this moment to be in the future, right? And so you have all of this um, collective agenda. You see block name here. You see the African-American round table here in which there's a policy agenda that is connected to we have the audacity to see ourselves in the future. So putting ourselves in context, remember what I was saying about Stokely Carmichael that said that policy wasn't for me, that's for y'all. This is the same thing. These leaders in these organizations and community members know good and well they shouldn't have to ask for a policy to be treated like human beings, to be protected, to be fed, to be cared for, to be clothed, to be sheltered. They don't need policy to tell them that's important. That's why if you're waiting for policy to tell you that's important, you can disrupt all of that by putting your hands directly, your money in, directly in the hands of Black women to answer the material conditions of the people. And that's always going to be the thing that's the focus while you know, we have a historical perspective, the theoretical perspective about anti-Blackness, the material conditions of the people are the impact of us not answering or not dealing with these issues, right? And so what does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean for you, for y'all, for us in this moment to understand that we know that anti-Blackness is real? We understand that we have had folks, Black women fighting for it, <laughs> Black folks calling it out and naming it, that our strategies might be different, but our ultimate goal is the same. What does that mean for you <laughs> in this moment as you have these wake workers like Block and Love on Black Women and Comforce and the African American Roundtable showing up and being present and doing the work that the system fails to do? which is protect Black people's sense of dignity, right? And so we're in this situation asking ourselves, well, what does this demand of us and how do we show up? And I have to uplift the folks that I just shared being really transparent, Block, Metcalf, <laughs> Metcalf Community Bridges, Love on Black Women, African American Roundtable, Comforce MKE. We're talking about Vaughn May's leadership. We're talking about Marquesa Tucker's leadership. We're talking about Siobhan DeSis's leadership. We're talking about Melody McCurtis's leadership. We're talking about Angela Lane's leadership. I would have zero relevance in any of the work that I do if they weren't making sure that this stuff wasn't happening every day on the ground, right? So this isn't just thinking about, again, going back to what Malcolm said, it's not that we have different goals or objectives. I'm trying to see Black people get free too. My particular method is I can talk my SHIT. <laughs> I can have conversations in academic spaces with people who are learning, walk them through a journey of intellectual thought that might align them to action. And I am committed to being connected to what's the day-to-day -day material reality and conditions of our people. And how can I make sure that these conversations are not separate? How can I make sure that the policy demands that are coming up from the community organizations are met with the research agendas of the academy and other independent um, academics? How can we make sure those things are connected so they're not working against each other so whiteness doesn't come in? And let me just be clear about whiteness who comes in. Your white-led large nonprofit organizations who said, I'm gonna fund this and not that. <laughs> and so these things have this forever disconnection when that's not necessary. These policy demands should be uplifted and are a part of our research agendas as intellectuals. There should be no difference between them other than the methods, as i.e., you can use examples that are happening on your block if you're a community organization. I'm gonna use books that are available in my classroom because I'm in higher ed. They do not change, that does not change that we're both struggling for liberation. 
right? So I leave that to all of us, right? To think about the practical application. What does that mean for you to show up in this moment? What does this look like? What does this feel like? How do you hold it? What, what arises for you? What feelings come into your body, right? Because like I hear all this and y'all can probably tell I get fired up, right? It's like, yes, Black people are in the future and we're fighting for it now. And we're fighting for it now because we've always been fighting for it. There's never been a break in us fighting for it. But what does it mean for us to continue fighting for it, but to see it, to make it tangible, to hold it as something that's a practical imperative for us to show up every day? What does that mean? What's that mean to you? What is your responsibility for knowing this, right? That's where we're at, <laughs> right? If we're understanding this struggle, Right, we put it in the historical per perspective, put it in the theoretical perspective, we put it in the material perspective, in the practical per perspective, in this moment. What is your responsibility for this knowledge? What does this look like for you in the work that you do, in the conversations that you have? As we enter into this space of family and connection, what kind of disruption <laughs> should be occurring? These are the questions that we uplift in thinking about this moment. And so I just want to kind of close out and open up for us to have some conversation, Q&A, um, thinking about the fact that this is the path that was set out for us to complete, right? It's not that we were supposed to remain in this circle of doing the same things over and again because it's either you fight for Black people or you're just comfortable in your own oppression. It's for us to say, no, this fight is continuing to go. <laughs> it's continuing to be a part of our narrative. My mama was a freedom fighter. My grandma was a freedom fighter. My great grandma was a freedom fighter. And what does it mean for us to get closer, right? To understanding that future and manifesting that future. So I hope that this was informative, that you got something from it, that at least, you know, invited that conversation about what, what is the connection between these realities, bringing the historical perspective into now, highlighting Milwaukee as having some really dope on the ground folks and putting that into perspective. I do see a question, should I just go for it? Um, so what I'm going to do, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Liston. Um, as you were speaking, I was like, when is she going to run for office? Um, <laughs> just my opinion, I'm just putting it out there. Um, but this was excellent. I always enjoy um, hearing you speak. So this was really an honor for, for all of us. Um, as I've been doing for all of our speakers, I've been taking notes. So for my students, I have about four pages of notes. So <laughs> um, I hope they look forward to the exam at the end of the course. Um, I really liked how you spoke about um, anti-Blackness. Mm -hmm. And as you know, this is part of a series that's looking at Black activism in the US and Brazil. And um, we're focusing on Milwaukee. Um, you know, so there's the book by Patrick Jones about uh, Milwaukee Selma of the North. Mm -hmm. And for me, Milwaukee is the Brazil of the North mm -hmm. um, because it's so anti-Black. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really why I wanted to have these two places in conversation. There are so many similarities, it's, it's amazing. Um, so I have some questions, but we do have a question in the chat. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask my question and I will read the, the question in the chat. And then, um, you know, with the time that we have, you can answer those. And then if we have more questions, I'll also, um, read that one to you so that, you know, you can answer that. Yeah. So I, I also love how you end it, which is basically for all those watching, what is your responsibility after this lecture, right? So they, they received the knowledge, they were able to, in, you know, engage with that. So now what is their responsibility? Mm -hmm. um, so the question that I have is you talked about all of these great groups. You also gave us historical context of black activism in Milwaukee. So, but then you also talked about how, and I've heard a lot of black activists talk about this, how um, black people, we don't have to engage white people, right? We can have black people, we can have this conversation or, or as you called it, the internal black conversation. We can have the internal black conversation but if we do that, and, and I do believe we should do that, um, 
for those, how do we then challenge white supremacist institutions and structures that will lead to, right? We all know the goal is liberation. So if the goal is liberation, how can we, um, for example, um, alleviate income inequality? How can we get rid of um, inequality in employment? How can we get rid of all of these other things, you know, um, black people being incarcerated um, more often than whites for the same crimes? Um, so that's the first question for me. And then there was uh, the question in the chat, which is, um, what activities have concerned you about families, marriage and children in black communities? Do you think activists and activism have a role to play in building basic units of black folks in Milwaukee? So that was an anonymous question, so I don't know who asked it. But those are the two questions that we have. And like I said, I'll keep looking for other questions. Absolutely. No, thank you for that. Um, so thinking about the first question about like, we have this internal conversation with how do we fight white supremacy at the same time? <laughs> what does that look like? Or what does that feel like? And I'm thinking about um, what's that quote? Uh, Treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity, right? <laughs> if you haven't heard that or thought about that, that sat, sat with me. Treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. And it came up in thinking about your question because I think the reverse is true. Loyalty to blackness is actually loyalty to humanity as well, right? Because if we need to, tra <laughs> to have treason on whiteness, that means we should be being loyal to blackness. And I was just speaking to someone in a previous conversation that when you become a part of black affirming spaces, you become radically more sensitive to how whiteness shows up. If you're not embraced by black affirming, black loving, black caring family units, um, organizational units, you become almost desensitized and expected of how white supremacy is showing up in your life, right? So you're like expecting that no one's gonna accept, you know, how I present this thing or let me tone this down or let me like make my hair right. Like you become, that becomes normal. But if you make your black affirming spaces your norm, when whiteness shows up, it's like, whoa, it becomes like a bright glaring light. And so, for me, I think it's a response is the, the deeper we dig in with black affirming spaces, the more conscious we will be of how whiteness works. <laughs> and when we loosen up on black affirming spaces or black only spaces, we make room for whiteness to be normalized and anti-blackness to become our reality and accept it, right? And I think it happens on a whole bunch of levels. I remember, you know, one more time, I'm a proud alum of Howard University. And I remember when I decided to go, my best friend was like, I can't go. My dad said I wouldn't know how to deal with white people after going there. And if you've ever met people who have gone to Howard or other HBCUs, we are probably the most attuned to how white people show up because we've been into a affirming black space where it was just blackness all around us and absorbing us. So I think about those you know, the churches, family units, um, Black Greek letter organizations, women's clubs, all these spaces in which Black people connect and it's inherently Black and it's Black about it. We talk Black, we do Black things, <laughs> we affirm Black identities, and a white person shows up. That is like, <laughs> who let you in here? How you, the questioning becomes way more deep. But because our, our professional spaces are often within white organizations, white people show up, do the most audacious things, and no one questions them because we expect it there. Right. And so I think that we build up a better resilience to white supremacy by investing our emotional labor in black only spaces. Um, thinking about the second question about black families, marriage, children, blah, 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 um, in communities, I will say that but I think that Black activists and activism are fighting for the liberation of Black people in multiple ways, right? <laughs> and they want Black people to be whole and together in whatever that looks like for them because it isn't one way, right? And so I would not say that activists are fighting for a specific thing to look for. Like it should be this kind of family or this kind of thing. I mean, I'll be transparent. I'm not fighting for marriage. <laughs> like on a personal level, I understand marriage as an institution, as a role, and for some people it works, and for other people it's not a goal or a destination, it's just a thing that exists. And so when we put it out there as like we have to be striving for this kind of family unit or this kind of family structure, 
it's actually anti-blackness creeping back up in us again, right? And so we should just be thinking about, well, what does it look like for me to be in a loving and affirming space if I'm part of a couple, throuple, if I'm in a same gender loving, if none of us have any gender, if sex isn't something I'm interested in, we should be protecting all of those spaces if they're loving and affirming for, for Black people, right? And so it's thinking about, yes, <laughs> they are doing that work on the regular basis and have a responsibility to look at it, but also we shouldn't be boxing in that it should only look one way. And just to think on a personal level of how activist shows up or activism and that label of activist, activist turns into celebrity celebrity turns into ego, ego turns into deceit, and that turns into the demise of the whole situation. I think we can testify that. I could testify that from my own personal lived experience, but we can see that playing out in Milwaukee in the media at this moment, right? So we just have to understand that this isn't to gain celebrity, it's to do the work, and doing the work can easily pass off. It isn't about a name or a person, it's about those organizations, those communities, and those spaces. So yes, for loving and affirming spaces for Black people, no to having it be very isolated and looking just one way. I hope that helps. Excellent. Um, and I I think also, even when we look historic, historically at the Black experience in the U.S., right, it, it would be very strange to say that we always had these, you know, institutions of, of, of marriage historically, like during slavery, that's not what we had. Mm -hmm. We didn't have, we had families where, you know, 10 people were not actual blood relatives. So we can't pretend that that's not part of our history. Our, historically, our families look different. So mm -hmm. um, there was another question that, I don't know, it looks like it was kind of cut off. But it, um, it said something about they would like to know your thoughts on the intersection of anti-Blackness and anti-male something. I don't know. It looks like it was cut off. So I don't know if that was supposed to be anti-Blackness and anti-maleness. I'm, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but maybe you can just talk about the intersections of not only anti-Blackness, but we could also talk about um, you know, people who are misogynist, people who are homophobic. So how do all of these things work together? Yeah. Yeah. I think about the intersections of anti-Blackness being rooted in us not understanding or having enough spaces to see Black people in so many different ways, right? And it, the biggest example comes to me is television, right? <laughs> when a Black character shows up on TV, we're all talking about it all over social media. Like, and I can't believe they're represented da, 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 <laughs> this way, that way, this way. And it's like, Black people can be all these characters, but we're so limited in our exposure of Black identity in our personal lives that one little manifestation is supposed to hold all our hopes and dreams. <laughs> and that, that doesn't, you know, that's not true. That's not expected. That's not a liberated mindset. I think um, if there's any relationship between, or if thinking about the gender relationship, anti-Blackness is also around misogynoir and understanding about how the, the world is inherently anti-femme, <laughs> anti-woman. Um, I don't, and I don't identify with, and I can't ideologically understand an anti-male mindset unless someone's explicitly like saying this is my hate destination <laughs> that I don't <laughs> um, deal with males. But I do think there's a lot of room to understand that the critique of anti-Blackness and the rootedness in white supremacy demands a critique of patriarchy and its roots in white supremacy. So we have to make those, those connections in which where we show up and have to demand a different thing, which can be uncomfortable, right? You know, I can fight and talk about Black people <laughs> all day with all the ferociousness and people can come at me for being a, a cis woman and how I don't make enough room for trans folks and I need to be called out for that. And they will, I'll be like, Ooh, that's the thing I need to own or how ableist I am because I haven't you know, made room for how those things show up. So that stuff is uncomfortable sometimes to recognize that how the system is set up, you actually don't struggle there. Right. And so when that's not a struggle, and I think that's what we have to understand about male identity, as the system is set up, it's not maleness. <laughs> that is the struggle that you're working through. You might be working through blackness, you might be working through queerness, you might be working through trans identities, you might be working through classism, but you're not working through a male being the problem 
there. And so we're thinking about the societal structures and a little bit more breathing room to these constraints that have been so narrowly defined, as in this is what male is, this is what woman is, that has been part of our own, um, it's already five, but part of our own strangulation on ourselves, <laughs> that own self-imposed anti-Blackness that said, well, we can be Black, but Black has to show up like this, and that's anti-Black in and of itself. Thank you so much. So it is now five o'clock. <laughs> Thank you again. Um, this was a wonderful presentation. So I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Victoria, for hosting Thank you. This. Thank you, mommy. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yes, yes. this was wonderful. This was excellent. Um, so as I mentioned before, we will have another one, another webinar on December 3rd. Um, and it's with Douglas Belchior, who is a Black activist in Brazil. So, um, Dr. Leeson, maybe you can join us, you know, you can um, watch it or invite any, anyone else, you know, um, because it would just be great. It's always great for activists across the world, you know, to hear from each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Monique, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.